Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this video, we're going to start doing some calculus with polar functions, that is functions of the form r equals f of theta. And frankly speaking, a lot of the calculus is going to be based upon the fact that we can view polar functions as parametric functions. And how one does that comes from what we discussed before. Um, we had seen previously that as we switch from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, we get the following r equals r, or sorry, x equals r cosine theta, and y equals r sine theta. Well, since r is itself a function of theta, we could insert for r f of theta, like we do right here, and so we get x equals f of theta times cosine of theta, and y equals f of theta times sine of theta, and so that way we can view polar functions as parametric equations associated to the parameter theta. And so the reason why this is an important perspective is that as we want to talk about tangent lines of a polar curve, the tangent line will still be determined by this rise over run. We're looking, the slope of the tangent line will still be dy over dx. And so we have to express dy over dx knowing how r is a function of theta. So if y and x are both functions of theta, you can replace dy with dy over d theta and dx with dx over d theta by the chain rule that these two quotients will still be the same thing. And if you take the derivative of, uh, well, I guess we'll do y first. If you take the derivative of y with respect to theta first using the product rule, you're going to get r prime. And by r prime here, this will always mean, r prime will always mean dr over d theta and theta prime will always mean dy over dx. If we ever abbreviate that, we won't deviate from those. So taking the derivative of y with respect to theta, remember f of theta is just r right here. So by the product rule, you're gonna get the derivative, uh, you'll get the derivative of r first times sine theta. Then you're gonna get r times the derivative of sine theta, which is cosine. Uh, taking the derivative of x with respect to theta, you're gonna get r prime cosine. And then you're going to get negative r times sine theta. The derivative of cosine is a negative sine. And so we can actually get the derivative here. And so this is a formula one can memorize. But really, these yellow boxes right here is what you want to know. That x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. And since r is a function of theta, you can take the derivative with respect to theta on top and bottom. And that's going to help us out here. So let's do a little bit of analysis of a cardioid. Take the function r equals 1 plus sine of theta. And let's look at some tangent lines for this curve. For example, let's find the tangent line uh, when theta equals pi thirds. Well, let's focus on the slope. We can do the rest of it if we want to. Now, pi thirds, be aware, it's going to be uh, it's going to be about this angle right here. And so the tangent line we can kind of visualize would be something like this thing right here. If ever you miss your dot, just draw the dot bigger. So you get becomes a tangent line. So this is roughly speaking what we're looking for. We need to find the slope of this line. So what we're looking for is we're trying to find y prime. Like we saw before is dy over d theta divided by dx over d theta. And so be aware that we're going to be getting r, which is 1 plus sine theta, times that by sine. We need to take the derivative of this on top. And then we have to do the same thing for x. We get 1 plus sine theta times cosine theta. Take the derivative with respect to theta there. So you're just going to replace the r with the 1 plus sine theta we have from the function right here. So by the product rule on the top, you take the derivative of 1 plus sine, you're going to get a cosine. And then you'll times that by sine theta. And then you take the derivative, well, the 1 plus sine theta will stick around. Then you take the derivative of sine, which is cosine. We'll come back to that one in a little bit. Uh, on the derivative on the bottom, well, again, derivative of 1 plus sine is going to be cosine again. But this time, you're going to times that by cosine. And then you're going to get a 1 plus sine theta. And you're going to times by the derivative of cosine, which is sine. So I'm going to get a sine right there. And I'm also going to replace this with a minus sine right there. So let's distribute across the sum right here on top and bottom. This is going to give us a sine theta times cosine theta. This is going to give us a cosine theta. We can distribute the cosine onto the 1. We distribute the cosine onto the sine. You're going to get another sine theta. Uh, sorry, another, another sine theta, cosine theta. So I'm just going to put a 2 in front right there. 
Uh, in the denominator, what we end up with, we're going to get a cosine times cosine, so a cosine squared. Uh, when you distribute, you're going to get one on the sine, so that's going to be a negative sine. And then when you get sine and sine, that's going to be a negative sine squared, like so. And so to try to make this thing a little bit simpler, I'm going to want to utilize some trig identities. Notice that 2 sine theta, cosine theta, that's, the, that's half of the double angle identity. So we can end up with a sine of 2 theta plus cosine. And then this sits above, well, actually kind of, kind of works out nicely here. Cosine squared minus sine squared, that's half of the double angle identity for cosine. You end up with a cosine of 2 theta minus sine theta. So there's some symmetry to there. So this right here is just the derivative y prime, right? Uh, we next need to calculate what is the derivative when it's evaluated at theta equals pi thirds. That was the angle of consideration. So plugging all of these appropriate parts in there, you're gonna get sine of two pi thirds uh, plus cosine of pi thirds. This sits above cosine of two pi thirds minus sine of pi thirds. And if, if it helps, of course, pi thirds uh, would be 60 degrees, two pi thirds would be 120 degrees. Now, two pi thirds references to pi thirds, it's just in the second quadrant. Now, sine in the second quadrant is identical, just uh, the angle doesn't make a difference. So you just get the first one right here, you could replace. Uh, you could just replace it with a sine of pi thirds. It would be the exact same thing. And so sine of pi thirds is going to be root 3 over 2. We're adding to that cosine of pi thirds, which is 1 half. Uh, in the denominator, we're going to get cosine of 2 pi thirds, which 2 pi thirds, it, it, it references pi thirds, but for cosine, that'll actually make it negative. So you're going to get a negative 1 half in the denominator minus pi thirds, uh, which is going to give you the square root of 3 over 2. So despite as complicated as this might look, notice in the bottom, in the top and bottom, you get 3 over 2 plus 1 half. Factor out the negative sign, you're going to get 3 over 2 plus 1 half. This will simplify just to be a negative 1. And that's then the slope of this line that we had above here. And, you know, if you look at that line as we drew it, it's not perfectly drawn to scale, but negative 1 actually does seem to be a, a about a... A slope of that tangent line. So I feel like our calculation worked out really well. Um, and I'll, so another thing to consider is where are the horizontal and vertical tangent lines of this graph? And on the picture, we can see them. Uh, there looks like there's a horizontal right there at pi halves. There's going to be two horizontals uh, in the third and fourth quadrants. We'll have to come back and figure out what those are. There's going to be two vertical tangent lines in the first and fourth second quadrant and then also we're going to see that this cusp here at three pi thirds is going to be kind of suspicious for our derivative here when we investigate it so let's find these points for where the tangent line is vertical or horizontal coming back to our formula right dy over dx remember this was sine of two theta plus cosine theta over cosine of two theta minus sine of theta that's what we saw on the previous slide. Uh, did we not? I think we did. Uh, let me just double check. Uh, what was it? Yep, that's what we had. So we want to figure out when this thing is horizontal, the, when the tangent line is going to be horizontal and vertical. So just as sort of a quick reminder here, the, the tangent line is going to be a horizontal tangent line when we get that our dy is 0, but dx is not 0. And the vertical tangent lines are going to correspond when the dy is not 0, but the dx is 0. Now, of course, if they both are 0 at the same time, you have the indeterminate form 0 over 0. And you might need L'Hopital's rule to help us determine what's going on there. All right? And so let's start off with the horizontal. Well, let's actually solve, solve these things when they're equal to 0, right? Sine of 2 theta plus cosine of theta. When does this equal 0? It'll probably be better to go back. Uh, sine of 2 theta will replace it with 2 sine theta, cosine theta. I think the calculation will be a little bit easier when all of the angles are the same. Uh, you notice you can factor out a cosine theta from this that leaves behind 2 sine theta plus 1. And so by the zero product property, this implies that cosine theta equals 0 
or that two sine theta plus one equals zero. So for cosine, cosine is equal to zero. Uh, this will happen at the top of the unit circle and at the bottom of the unit circle. So we're looking at pi halves and three pi halves. And of course, angles which are coterminal to those ones. Now for two sine theta plus one, if we solve for sine here, uh, you're gonna subtract one, divide by two. We're trying to solve the equation, when does sine theta equal negative one half? Now we do know that at a 30 degree angle, sine is equal to one half, or that is sine at pi sixth will give us a one, uh, a, 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 sorry, a sine of pi six will give us a one half. So using reference angles, that can help us out a lot here. Uh, we are gonna get that theta would, since if sine is negative, it's gonna be in the third quadrant or the fourth quadrant, but it should reference to pi sixth. Now that's gonna be exactly seven pi sixth and 11 pi six. Now admittedly there are angles coterminal to that, but um, as the whole cardioid is graphed by from zero to two pi, we only have to find theta between zero and two pi here. So this tells us when the denominator, when the numerator goes to zero here. Uh, in contrast, when does the denominator go to zero? Cosine of two theta minus sine theta is equal to zero. Um, likewise, we want to put, you know, we want to compare apples to apples. We need to have theta and theta, not a two theta here. So we could switch cosine of two theta back to cosine squared minus sine squared. Uh, but I actually think a different uh, trigonometric identity would be useful here, right? Uh, so we could also use the fact that cosine of two theta, oh boy, let's see if I can remember it. Uh, we, we, we use this identity all the time for trigonometric identities. If you don't remember it, we'll just, just kind of do this. Cosine squared minus sine squared right here minus sine. Now, because of the Pythagorean identity, we do know that cosine squared theta minus or plus sine squared theta equals one. Um, if you solve for cosine squared here, you're gonna get cosine squared is equal to one minus sine squared. So just make that substitution, one minus sine squared, in which case you end up with one minus two sine squared theta minus sine. So what you kind of see right here, I just want to point out that if you don't remember a trig identity, your, your first goal doesn't always have to be go look it up. You can often derive them from the trig identities you do know here. So this is cosine of two theta. Um, the reason I prefer this format right here is because now you have a sine squared, you have a sine, you have a constant. You can treat this like a quadratic equation in terms of sine. Uh, if like if you replace sine with just a simple x, you'd have one minus two x squared minus x. You could factor this thing um, and this thing should factor off as, let's see, one plus sine theta times one minus two sine theta, just by usual factoring technique right there. And you can foil this thing out to double check. One times one is one. You get sine times negative two sine, which gives you negative two sine squared. And then you'll get one and negative two sine, that's, that's, that's negative two sine. And then you're gonna get um, a sine with just one sine. So that combines to give you a single sine. So there's a reverse foil going on there. Kind of skip some of the details. I hope that's okay with everyone. Uh, and so which case, if we continue with this, we're gonna get one plus sine theta equals zero, or we get one minus two sine theta equals zero. So now for the first one, sine theta equals negative one. When is sine equal to negative one? That happens at the bottom of the hour. That is the bottom of the unit circle. That'll happen at three pi halves. And then for the other one, if we solve for sine, we're looking for when sine theta equals one half. And like we said before, that'll happen at pi sixth. But also whenever sine is positive, it references to pi sixth, which would also happen at five pi sixth. So we see that the numerator of the derivative will be zero at pi halves, three pi halves, seven pi six, and 11 pi six. It'll be, the denominator will be zero at three pi halves, pi six, and five pi sixth. And you'll notice here that there is a little bit of overlap. Three pi halves shows up in both situations. We're gonna have to investigate this one a little bit further because in this situation, our derivative dy over dx looks like zero over zero. Um, if we go back to the picture uh, that we saw before, this actually might agree with what we were looking at, right? 
Uh, so when does when does the when does the numerator go to zero? Pi halves. That's the top of the circle at the top of the cardioid. And then at seven pi six and eleven pi six. So what we're seeing right here is this one happens at pi halves. This one right here, it's happening at seven pi six. And this one right here is happening at eleven pi six, just like we calculated. In terms of vertical tangent lines, well, three pi halves, we'll come back to that one. You have pi sixth and five pi sixth. So we can see that for these ones, the vertical tangent on the right happens at pi sixth, and the one on the left happens at five pi sixth. And so by symmetry, those all seem to match up right. And so the suspicious thing that's left over is at three pi halves, right? That's where the cusp is on our cardioid. So it's not surprising that three pi halves gives you this indeterminate form. Funky things are happening at three pi halves for our cardioid. So what we've seen so far is that dy over dx, um, you're getting this indeterminate form. So we're going to apply L'Hopital's rule in this context. We're going to take the derivative of the top and bottom yet again. Um, so if we take sine of two theta plus cosine theta, we're going to take the derivative of that again with respect to theta. For the bottom, we have cosine of two theta, that is a two, minus sine theta. Take again the derivative with respect to theta, because uh, that's how we try to resolve this indeterminate form using L'Hopital's rule. So L'Hopital's rule will give us two cosine two theta minus sine theta. And then on the denominator, we're gonna get negative two sine of two theta minus cosine theta like so. And so then um, continuing on from there, if we were to plug in three pi halves, because we really only care about this thing um, as theta, as theta is approaching three pi halves. So let's try that in this time around. Uh, you would get two cosine of three pi, I like that, minus sine of three pi halves. And then in the denominator, we're going to get negative 2 sine of 3 pi minus cosine of 3 pi halves. So now we have the battle, the clash of the titans. Who's stronger, numerator or denominator? Who wants to win this fight? So going through this, some things to note. Cosine of 3 pi is the same thing as cosine of pi. That's going to be a negative 1. Sine of 3 pi is going to be a 0. Sine of negative, uh, sine of 3 pi over 2 that's gonna also be a negative one. And then cosine of three pi over two, that's gonna be a zero. So you can see what happens here is in the numerator, we end up with negative two plus one. The denominator, we're gonna end up with zero plus zero. So it looks like we end up with like a negative one over zero, assuming we didn't make any mistakes along the way. Uh, but this seems to say that the winner winner is the denominator here. So this thing wants to be a vertical tangent line. A vertical tangent. And if we come back to the picture of the cardioid, that does seem to agree with what we were seeing right there, right? Uh, as this thing bends upward and bends upward, this cusp is coming to a sharp point and thus having this vertical tangent that sits in between them. So we can analyze uh, polar functions using the same type of tangent line consideration we had in the past. Uh, just make sure that when you take the derivative, that you are taking the derivative, treating the polar function as a parametric function. Then we can use derivatives and tangent lines to measure things about monotonicity. We could do the second derivative to measure things about concavity and all of that business for these polar functions, just like other functions as well. And so that brings us to the end of lecture 33. Um, where we talked about some polar derivatives here. In the next video for polar or for lecture 34, we're going to talk about uh, how integrals are affected when we start looking at polar functions. So stay tuned for that one.